What's going on guys and welcome to transitioning away from tracking part three. So up until now we focused heavily on the process. We've talked about, we've covered different hunger sensations. We've talked about what satiated feels like. We've covered the hunger and fullness scale. The focus of today's video is going to be how you can achieve your goals without tracking. So the, the answer to this, this question, this topic is super extensive and it varies considerably depending on the person. So people's plans are going to look totally different depending on their needs, their goals, their strengths, their weaknesses. So what we're going to do in this video is we're going to go through a super simple process you can use to help you build a plan that fits your needs and goals. If I had to summarize everything we've talked about in the last three videos, and if I had to summarize how to transition away successfully, it would be, in one sentence, it would be the objective of what we're trying to do is we're trying to take everything we learned from tracking and the behaviors we formed, and we're trying to combine that with our hunger and fullness sensations. So it is an integration of these things, not a substitution of one thing for the other. So we're not trying to take everything we learned and the behaviors we formed and throw it out the window. What we're trying to do is take that and then build on it. So we're going to maintain the, the habits we developed and we're going to have obviously all that we learned from tracking and we're going to take the training wheels off because we no longer need them and we're going to add a new element to our decision making process that an, an element that, that gives us a greater level of awareness than we've ever had before an awareness that will allow us to do things that we weren't able to do when we were tracking and when I was sitting down to prepare for this the the thing that came to my mind is like when I'm working with a client one of the the more complex situations um, is the question of, well, what do I do if we're tracking is, well, what do I do if I have a day that's abnormal? What do I do if I have a day where I do a bunch of extra activity or I have a day where I don't do nearly as much activity as what, you know, what our protocol is or what their typical lifestyle is like? The question is, okay, well, what do I do on that day? And, you know, we set up some sort of plan for that. Uh, but this is just a, a great example of when you're not tracking, you can let your intake uh, match your expenditure. You can let it flow more naturally. So on days you're a lot more active, you can eat a bit more naturally. And on days you're less active, you can eat less. And of course, that depends on your goals. And of course, you can do that while you're tracking. But you know, it's not always, you know, there's, there's a lot of thought that goes into that. And it's like, it's, you're trying to, to match it's all about trying to just estimate numbers at that point where when you're not tracking you can just kind of go with the flow and to touch base more with how you're feeling and, and, and the feedback your body's giving you. So your response to a situation, the decision that you make will be based on a variety of things, not just one thing. So going back to Adam's question from part two where he talks about being hungry, uh, being bloated and thus not feeling hungry, but mentally knowing that you haven't eaten very much food that day. That's a perfect example of where you would use a variety of things. So you would use your goals. You would use what the week as a whole has looked like. You would use, you know, whether or not you're training that day. You would use all of that stuff to help you make your decision what to do in that situation. And then another important point is just, you know, you aren't necessarily changing your lifestyle you're just not writing down what you eat. So, and I touched on this a little bit, I believe it was in part two, where, you know, you'll, just because you're not, we're not writing it down anymore, doesn't mean we're necessarily changing anything about the way, you know, what we eat or how we eat. And to kind of build on that point, and this is, I think, just another huge part of transitioning away successfully and kind of taking the anxiety that kind of comes with, you know, the thoughts of, you know, what happens when I don't track anymore? Am I, am I just going to fall apart and, you know, lose all my progress? So the, the, the concept of starting slow. So initially maintaining 
the same eating behaviors you had when you were tracking. So maintaining you know, the, the same times of day you were eating and the same uh, about the same foods and about the same amount at each meal. So really, it's at first, it's just about not tracking anymore, but still kind of keeping that same routine that you have developed through tracking. And so this makes it one, it, it makes it easier to not only like mentally to, to know, okay, like this is like, it's, it makes the process easier, but it also allows you to more easily track your intake, to estimate your intake in your head if you want to. And so this is kind of, this is, this is how I did it initially. It was, I finished a contest prep and I was extremely burned out on tracking and what I did was I just quit tracking but I maintained my same eating patterns. I ate at about the same time each day, I ate about the same amount, I was eating similar foods and so, and, and, and with that, um, that allowed me to easily estimate my intake in my head and then I incorporated that hunger and fullness scale with it. And so I knew with those three pieces, with maintaining my same kind of eating routine, having that hunger and fullness scale, and then also having the ability to pretty accurately estimate my intake, I knew that it was, that I was going to be able to transition away and it wasn't going to be a big deal. So from there, let's move into just looking at, you know, what this four step process looks like. So step one is super simple, just you know, clarifying our goals. You know, what what specifically are our goals? You know, and how are we setting everything up? What are we setting everything up to achieve? From there, we would assess our behaviors and de determine if we think that our current behaviors are going to support these goals. If we think that they would support these goals, then we would maintain our behaviors. If we do not think that they that they would, then we would adjust our behaviors to what we think will support our goals. Step three is just setting up some sort of system to monitor our results. So that could be tracking our body weight, it could be pictures, it could be clothing, it could be measurements. You know, there's a variety of things we could use, but just setting up some sort of system that allows us to monitor our results. And then step four is we would assess our results and if what we're doing is working, we would continue executing our plan. And if it's not working, then we would modify our behaviors to what we think would work. So let's just look at a, a quick example. So let's say we have someone who is currently tracking and wants to transition away from doing so. So step one, let's say that, you know, just getting crystal clear on their goals, they've determined they want to gain between one to three pounds per month and they want to get stronger. Step two would be assessing their behaviors and determining if they think their current behaviors are going to lead to those results. And so, again, like because we're talking about transitioning away from tracking and nutrition, the, the three big pieces to all of this are, the two I've already stated are, are one, you know, combining everything you learned from tracking and the behaviors, behaviors you formed and combining that with your hunger and fullness signals. The second thing is just starting slow and transitioning away, just kind of first just trying to get away from tracking but trying to maintain similar eating patterns. And then step three is, and I, I chose the, the words set up, uh, a flexible eating routine, but most likely, and it was this way with me, and it's, it's like, it's most like, the, it's like this for most people, is if you've been tracking, even if you're, you know, following flexible dieting, consuming different foods, like more often than not, like you probably have an eating routine that's established. You know, depending on your job and your lifestyle, you probably eat about the same foods every day for the most part. You probably eat about the same number of meals and snacks per day, and you probably eat at about the same times every day. Like maybe that'll vary slightly on the weekends or you'll have some abnormal days, of course, but for the most part, you have an eating routine. And so a large part to this is since we're talking about not tracking anymore, is just making sure that you still have some sort of structure. So it's not like you just transition away from tracking and now you're just kind of winging it. Uh, you know, it's, you maintain that structure. And Eric actually wrote a, a, a really good blog post on this, which I will link in the description box below. So step three is, is this guy just decided, or girl, just decided to monitor their results either through body weight, uh, weekly average, and through tracking their training. And then step four, is assessing the results and if not achieving their desired results, 
this is when you would adjust your behavior. So you, of course, you take your best educated estimate at first to help you set up your initial plan, but then at that point, you use the feedback that you're getting to adjust things. And so this is where, like for example, we're talking about someone who wants to gain weight. You know, this might be if, if what they're doing is not working or they're, they're experiencing a lot of GI distress because they're consuming too much fiber, this might be where they adjust their food choices and try to, to start swapping, you know, uh, lower calorie foods for higher calorie foods and swapping, uh, like reducing their fiber intake, maybe, maybe consuming a little less fruits and veggies or a little less whole grains. Uh, or it could be as simple as adding in if it's maybe it's they're not getting enough calories and they notice the scale is not increasing the way they want it to. Maybe it's as simple as adding 300 or 400 calories to one of their meals or adding in an extra snack during the day or aiming to be a bit fuller at each meal. And so the, another thing that, that, that also that I have found helpful is even though we're not tracking our calorie or our macronutrient intake anymore, we still may find it helpful to track certain behaviors either on paper or keep a mental tally. And so like just for example, like my situation right now, I'm going through a period where I'm just trying to maintain my body weight within a certain range. And I'm trying to maximize, you know, how much strength I can gain or muscle I can put on, and muscle I can put on within this range. And so that's that's my goals. And then to behavior-wise, I have my flexible eating routine set up. You know, I eat it's typically the same times each day, about the same amount, and typically the same foods that I sub in and out. Um, and then for monitoring my results, I grab body weight maybe once a week, uh, just because at this point, like I I have my behavior set up where I can, I, I know that I'll be able to stay within this range and do what I want to do as long as my lifestyle and all my behavior stay in place. So I don't really need to track my body weight or weigh myself too much. And then I track my training. So the one thing that I have noticed is that I was slipping just because I'm not cutting. And so my hunger levels aren't as high. And I found that my, I'm not consuming the amount of fruits and vegetables that I would like to hit. I'm not hitting my targets there. And I was doing a mental tally at first and I noticed that, oh shoot, I haven't really hit my targets for a little while now. And so what I did is I just started keeping, I keep my training in Excel doc and one of the sheets on my Excel doc, I started a list where I track my fruit intake, my total servings of fruit per day, my total ser servings of vegetables per day, and my, serving, uh, my protein feedings per day, my number of protein feedings. And that's just an example of just a simple behavior that I was slipping on. I wasn't getting my fruits and veggies in. And so I thought, hey, like, let me just start tracking this. And then now that it's on paper and it's in front of me, I can look at the week as a whole and I can notice if, if there's a pattern of me not hitting this stuff. And so I, then I can adjust and say, okay, now I wanna add a fruit to my breakfast. And I'm just gonna like make that a staple where now every day for breakfast, I've added a fruit into it. And like now I'm able to hit my targets as one example. And so, and, and that really leads to accountability, right? It's not that I don't know this stuff, but like sometimes when I am tracking it, like if I'm tracking a certain behavior, it holds me more accountable to it if it's written down. And I said I'm gonna hit two fruits per day. If it's written down, I'm much more likely to hit those two fruits per day compared to if I just keep it in my head and, and kind of just let one day blur into the next. Which leads to the final point of this video and probably the series is that tracking provides accountability. So when we track our intake, as long as we're tracking accurately, we know how much we ate. We know how many calories we ate, we know how much protein we ate, how many fruits and how many vegetables we ate. You know, when we're not tracking anymore, we don't know as precisely how much we consumed. And that's not necessarily a bad thing, but if someone's desire to achieve a goal isn't very strong, it can be easier to let things slide and to justify certain decisions if they aren't tracking. So, um, you know, it's, it's easier to, if it's not all written down and we don't have the hard data, it's easier to justify decisions and it's easier to make emotional decisions around what to eat, how much to eat. It's easier to grab that extra handful of, of, of something or, or to, to grab a random snack during the middle of the day if we don't have a structure set up, uh, if we're not tracking. All of that to say that if your desire or someone you're working with to achieve the goal isn't extremely strong, but you do want to achieve the goal, the method of not tracking may not be the best approach at this time. All right. 
Well, that is it for this video and most likely the series. I'm not opposed to making a far, part four. However, this is kind of just like in my head where I planned on ending it. But if there's still a lot of good questions or topics that I think would make a good part four, I'm definitely not opposed to, to doing another, another part of the series. And all of that to say, like everything we covered, this whole method of not tracking is just an option. It's just a different approach. So even if let's say you're in a situation where your goals, like you really don't need, need to track, but you just enjoy tracking, then keep tracking and you know, do what you want to do. So yeah, I hope you guys enjoyed this series and I will see you in the next series.